Hi, welcome back once again. I am and always remain Pastor Kempfert, Pastor Jacob Kempfert, coming to you from my study here at Gloria Dei Lutheran Church in beautiful Saginaw, Michigan. Happy to have you tune in once again. You know, over this past weekend, I had a few different people, um, all independent of each other, say that they really appreciate it when I record either sermons or Bible studies here in my study because it's more personal, more one-on-one. -on -one. And so I, I thought that that's, that's what I might try to do here um, with the Bible studies from now until the end of our session in uh, about a month. Um, so for these few remaining Bible studies that we have, I think I'm going to try, if time allows, to record them here in my study to give it a bit more of that uh, personal feeling. So today we are looking at the mark and the number of the beast from Revelation chapter 13, the very end of that chapter. This is um, one of the most difficult chapters probably in all of Scripture, <laughs> uh, the two beasts, and then especially these last three verses with the mark of the beast and the number of the beast. And um, we, we had a, a very good question on Sunday morning as to how do we know that we have the correct interpretation of this part of scripture because it is very difficult it's very challenging for us to understand exactly what God is telling us here and so there's because there's a wide variety of other interpretations and there's a wide variety of misinterpretations very bad interpretations how do we know that the interpretation we're going to hear um, in this next hour is the scripturally correct interpretation well the important aspect of that is scripturally correct interpretation Right? So our first rule is if we find something in Scripture that is unclear to us or difficult for us to understand, what's the first thing we do? We check elsewhere in Scripture. We use the very clear passages and portions of Scripture to help us understand parts of Scripture that might appear to be uh, unclear to us at first. So the rule is Scripture interprets Scripture. It's God's Word. So what better to use to interpret God's Word than God's Word elsewhere? And then another thing we can do is look at the context, right? What immediately comes before or after this one portion of scripture? Uh, what, what is it doing in the whole chapter we're looking at? And then also, what, what about the whole book, the book as a whole? Revelation is a, a pretty unique book in scripture, and it's not doing something uh, it's not trying to do the same things that a book like Kings or Samuel or Chronicles would do. You know, it's not charting history necessarily. It's uh, it's charting <laughs> the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's talking about his return, his second coming. And so it's, it's not going to talk about uh, strictly historical things necessarily. It will talk about that one event that's coming up is Christ's return. Uh, but we know for the most part it is symbolic. And so understanding the context of the chapter and the whole book of Revelation can help us with that. Uh, also, how to kind of combat misinterpretations or bad interpretations is if something doesn't fit, if a, an interpretation of a passage or a chapter that we have doesn't fit with what we know elsewhere in Scripture, then that's probably a misinterpretation. If one interpretation we have of a passage or a chapter is contrary to, directly contrary to what we hear elsewhere in Scripture, we know it's a wrong interpretation, right? And so a lot of these interpretations of the mark of the beast and the number of the beast actually are contrary to things that we hear very clearly elsewhere in Scripture. So that is the best guide that we have as to how we know this interpretation is accurate and what God wants us to uh, to understand and know and believe from this portion of Scripture. So, with that lengthy introduction, without further ado, let us go into the mark of the beast. Uh, and as we see, as we will see, the mark of the beast and the number of the beast are uh, both the same thing. They both refer to the beast. Uh, I just realized I don't have my Bible in front of me, so let me grab it. As we will be reading from the Bible right now, Revelation chapter 13, if you have your Bible at home or if you have your Bible app on your phone or the you know website that you go to, you can open that up right now 
and we are at Revelation chapter 13. We will read verses 16 through 18. Last time we talked about the two beasts. The beast out of the sea was any human institutions or systems or authorities that uh, Satan can corrupt and use um, to lead people astray or attack the church. Then the second beast, the beast out of the earth, is any religious authority or religious system, uh, particularly Christian-like, Christian-seeming authority or systems that the that the, the devil can twist in order to attack people's faith or mislead them. And in particular, it's the use of religion and particularly Christian-seeming religion to get people to worship human authority and institutions, right? So, and that, and that leads us into now uh, Revelation 13, verse 16. He that is the beast out of the earth, the religious beast, he also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666, or 666, as we sometimes say. All right, so there is a lot to unpack here. First, off, first of all is the mark of the beast. What is the mark? Well, this is a very specific word in Greek. You can see it uh, here. Charagma is what it's called. And this mark meant something that was imprinted, that was stamped or sealed. So, for example, uh, uh, seals on letters, wax seals we still have today. If you're fancy, you might get your initials or something in a wax seal and seal your letters this way. Also, coins were struck, literally struck. They were stamped with the imprint of the image on them. And also, we, we have something similar today. If you bring your penny to a science museum or to the very magical magic kingdom, you can press your penny down and it puts an imprint of this other image into the coin itself. So that's, that's sort of what's going on here. It's a stamped imprint, which is the mark. Uh, the purpose of it was to provide undeniable identification, to identify something so you know what it is, who it belongs to, uh, but then it also indicates um, approval of something. It has the, the seal, the stamp of approval, right? Um, and it, it coinciding with that, it, it might also give identification to or approval of a whole value system or a cultural value. Uh, we have something similar today. We have brands or we have logos of things. Um, the logo not only identifies the business or the product, but it also indicates a, a sort of value system, right? So we have the golden arches. We immediately know that means, oh, McDonald's, a restaurant. And then it might bring a whole other set of associations to our mind. We might then think, I'm loving it. And we might think, you know, think of that tune in the commercials. Da, 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 da. So it not only provides identification, but it also brings with it this whole other series of associations. Likewise, with the Nike swoosh, we might think, just do it. And then that also provides a set of values as well. We're not just buying the product, we're buying a value system. We're buying a, a way to identify ourselves, right? You're either an Apple person or you're a PC person, right? And that sort of comes with how you identify yourself as well. So this is what the mark means in the mark of the beast. It's an imprint and it provides undeniable identification and approval and it comes with a value system or belief system as well. So now the mark is on the right hand or on the forehead. And this is sometimes used to indicate, to say this will be, the mark of the beast will be a physical Marking, it will be something that happens to us on our right hand or on our forehead that you can either see with your eyes or it's, it's some sort of physical thing that happens to your physical body. But that doesn't quite fit with what we hear elsewhere in scripture about being marked on the right hand or on the forehead. Just because it happens to what's described as a physical 
part of the body doesn't mean it actually is a physical, visible, literal thing. Because here in the book of Exodus, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is directly connected to the Passover, um, the, God says that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast itself, shall be as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. So the hand and the forehead. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. So here, clearly, the feast itself is not a physical thing that is marked or happening to the right hand or the forehead, right? This is spiritual. This is a spiritual reality. So God's mark here, God's sign on the right hand and forehead, is directly connected to redemption. The word redeem means to buy back, to buy something back. And it's connected to the redemption of the firstborn on Passover. The, the blood of the lamb paid the redemption price so that the firstborn would be spared, right? The, the um, destroyer saw the blood on the doorpost and passed over that house and the firstborn was spared. So the mark on the right hand and on the head indicates to whom you belong, who bought you back. It indicates who you serve, who's your Lord, right? So this... Feast of Unleavened Bread connected to the Passover is a sign. It's a mark on your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the Lord bought you uh, back, brought you out of Egypt. So this mark is spiritual and invisible. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread is not something that physically marks the right hand or the forehead. It is not a physical marking, but a spiritual identity. This is just like baptism, right? Baptism has a physical element with the water, but even if you're not getting your head or your body washed in water, you are still baptized, right? It, it doesn't rely on some sort of physical mark to be effective. The seal of baptism is completely unseen by us, but it is seen and it is known to God. It is spiritual and invisible, but it is a spiritual reality. And here we have the scripture, you were redeemed, you were bought back, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. So it is the mark that says we have been bought back, we've been redeemed by God through Jesus Christ. A spiritual reality. That's the mark of the lamb. So what is the mark of the beast? How can we, help, how can we use that to help us understand this mark of the beast on the right hand and forehead? Well, this mark also is spiritual and invisible, right? Just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, like baptism. And from elsewhere in Revelation and elsewhere in Scripture, we know that one either has the seal of God, the mark of God, through faith, uh, which is their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, or the mark of this beast. There's no third option. There's no other way. Either you are saved through faith or you are not through uh, lack of faith or denial of faith. Second, this mark is not a literal or physical mark because it's spiritual and invisible, as we see with this use of uh, marking elsewhere in Scripture. So there's a few interpretations of this that we'll go through um, that are misguided at best, I think, that and they all take this to be a physical, literal marking. So this is an old argument that it's some sort of microchip that the government or corporations will want to put into your right hand or on your forehead that contains all your information, and then you can't buy or sell unless you have this information, uh, this microchip. This is an old theory that it's uh, that UPC codes are the mark and number of the beast. We'll look at that and debunk that. Also, what's currently going around is that this COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. Um, but just based on what we know from elsewhere in scripture with the mark of God, the seal of God, the mark of the beast also is not literal and physical. It is reality, but it's spiritual and invisible. So how do we know that it is not literal or physical? Well, let's look at the context now. We looked at elsewhere in scripture that said the mark on the hand and the head is a spiritual reality. Let's look at the immediate context in the chapter before, in chapter 12, and chapter 13. First, we have this image of the dragon, right, back in chapter 12. There's the horns, the seven heads, the crowns. 
this is all figurative, right? It's symbolic language. It's not a literal dragon with literal seven heads. Um, it, it, this is all symbols of things. The seven heads, the horns, the crowns. The, the horns are symbols of power or a desire for power, right? The crowns are symbols of um, divine power as well and authority, right? Or, or desiring divine authority. So it's all purely symbolic. Then we get into the dragon calling out of the sea, the first beast. Once again, it's all figurative. It's symbolic. This beast also has horns and multiple heads and crowns. And it, it is given a period of time that's 42 months. And we know from previously in Revelation, this 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days, this is symbolic of the entire end times, right? So once again, we have a figurative symbol. Next, we get the beast from the earth, the second beast. Once again, it's figurative. It has horns like a lamb, but the voice of the dragon. It holds up this image of the beast so that people worship the image of the first beast instead of the one true God, right? This is not a, a, a literal physical image. Sometimes it does appear that way. Uh, back in John, John's day, there were images of Caesar that one could worship, but it doesn't always have to be. There's not always one literal physical image of the beast that all the world is supposed to bow down and worship, right? So once again, it's figurative and symbolic. Which brings us to the mark of the beast. Now suddenly, everything has been figurative and symbolic, and now suddenly just this mark is literal, is a literal physical thing. Why? Why would this one thing be literal when everything else in the leading up to this is figurative, is symbolic? And if it is supposed to be literal, how do we know? What indication are we given from the text itself that this one thing is supposed to be physical and literal when everything around it is figurative? Now, this is where some people have argued, well, because it indicates a physical location on the body, the right hand or the head. But as we just heard from elsewhere in scripture, just because it mentions a physical part of the body doesn't mean it's a physical mark, right? It, it's a symbolic mark. So coinciding with the immediate context, the rest of the chapter, and also what the rest of scripture says, this is how we know this is not a literal mark because absolutely nothing in the text itself indicates that it's literal. I just realized I have the number of the beast pretty much on my forehead up here. I'm going to move that aside. Okay. Likewise, the seal of God is not a physical mark, right? So why would the mark of the beast, remember this is the second beast, this is the spiritual corruption, the religious corruption, why would this mark suddenly be physical when no other marking uh, is physical and when this beast specifically is a spiritual beast? So we can scripturally, rationally, reasonably take it to be figurative and not physical or literal. It is a uh, reality, but it's a spiritual, not a physical reality. So how do we know that this is not a microchip, a UPC code, a vaccine, any of these other interpretations that have been thrown out there. Let's go through these and debunk them because these are out there so commonly. These claims are made very often about this in some very uh, influential um, uh, groups as well. I think it's important that we go through and we debunk why we know it, it is not a microchip, it's not a UPC code, it's not the COVID vaccine. So first, is the mark a microchip? The, the short answer is no, and here is why. If we say that this mark of the beast is a microchip, that means we must say micro, I make, microchip can disqualify us from salvation, right? Because those who have the mark of the beast are cast into the fire, right? So the, the mark of the beast means damnation, which means if the mark of the beast is a microchip, that microchip itself is more powerful than Christ's life and death and resurrection from death because just that thing alone, that little piece of technology, is enough to disqualify you from salvation. And here in Romans 8, 38 and 39, once again we look to scripture, neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, 
neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, except microchips. No, of course not. That is false. That is not in Scripture, right? Scripture very clearly here says nothing, nor things to come, neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If the mark of the beast is a microchip, that means the microchip is able to separate us. A thing in creation is able to separate us from the love of God and from Christ Jesus, which is just not true, right? So we know it can't be a microchip because if one little piece of human technology is that powerful to to separate us from God's love, to nullify your baptism, to overthrow the true body and blood of Christ that have been placed on your lips in the Lord's Supper, then that means that one little piece of human technology is more powerful than sin itself, than Satan, than even death, because none of these things are able to do that, right? So if a microchip can do that, that means we're saying human technology is more powerful than sin, than Satan, and death itself. Do you put that much faith in human technology? I certainly don't. You you know that I don't because of how I've messed up human technology, or human technology has messed me up in the past just in recording this Bible study, right? I don't trust it to be that powerful because it's not that powerful. And ultimately, it, when we when we draw this out to the logical conclusion, claiming that this mark of the beast is a microchip means trusting the power of human technology to damn us over the power of God's word to save us and the faith that God has created in our heart to save us and to do what he says it's going to do. So, is this mark a vaccine or the COVID vaccine that's out there now. Um, This is some very, very bad rhetoric, I think, that has been out there that has been horribly misinforming people, uh, conspiracy theories and all of that. Um, The idea is if you get, um, if you don't get the the vaccine, then you're not going to be able to get a job. You're going to have to be isolated in quarantine. You're not going to be able to buy or sell, right? And that's something that we do here in scripture, that anyone without the mark is not able to buy or sell. Um, And then this, I don't, these are kind of unclear claims, so I don't know exactly what they're talking about. I'm guessing take the shot and and you think that you um, are able to defeat death or something, counterfeit immortality. Um, We'll talk about that though. And then not redeemable, if you take a, a a shot, a human vaccine, that disqualifies you from being redeemed? Short answer is no, right? For the same arguments that we used for microchip, there's no way something designed and and made by humans can be so powerful that it itself can nullify your salvation, right? Spiritual purity or impurity, they don't start with the body, with something that happens to the physical body, and then work inward. We know this from elsewhere in Scripture. They start with the heart and then work outward. As Jesus says here in Matthew, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that this defiles a person. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out from the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. And again, uh, in Romans 14, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. That is, it's not a matter of outward actions that we do to make us part of the kingdom of God or disqualify us from the kingdom of God. Rather, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is, it's a matter of the inward heart of faith rather than the outward body. Whoever thus serves Christ, whoever serves Christ uh, with righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, is acceptable to God and approved by men. So what gives us righteousness, peace, and joy here? It is not outward actions, but inward faith produced by the Holy Spirit. And how do we serve Christ? What what does Scripture clearly tell us here? It is not outward works, 
but it's inward faith producing outward works, right? So the idea that if you take the vaccine that you can no longer be redeemable by God, that is an outward work that is then producing an inward spiritual result, right? Which we know from scripture is not the way it works. It goes the opposite way. It starts with the heart. And then that, either faith or lack of faith, then produces outward actions. But the source is the heart, specifically the heart of faith. Plus, the, it, the scripture says the, the, the hand, the right hand or the forehead, the sight of the vaccine is neither the right hand nor the forehead. So this is not a mark that's on the hand or forehead if it's a physical thing. And we know it's not a physical thing, right? But the site where they, they give you the vaccine is, is not what this is claiming. Plus, beware of fear-mongering. Beware of people trying to make you unreasonably afraid. This, as it is, is not the case right now. You, and you could make the argument that, yeah, it's coming, though. It's going to be like this eventually. But that's a slippery slope argument. Plus, just general fear mongering. If there's an interpretation of scripture that is intended to produce fear in you, to make you afraid of something in this life, in this world, to make you afraid of human beings and human technology, that is not what scripture is intended for. That is not what God tells us in scripture. God says there is no fear in love. And just in general, this fear mongering, slippery slope, conspiracy theory thinking, um, Scripture tells us to avoid this, by the way. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 8, the prophet warns, do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. So even in Scripture, we are told to avoid this sort of conspiratorial, conspiracy theory, fear-mongering. Very sadly, I see this exact kind of fear-mongering, this conspiracy theory rhetoric cropping up all over popular Christianity today. But there's absolutely no basis for it in Scripture, most importantly, or in reality as well. Also, this idea of counterfeit immortality, that receiving something that could possibly benefit your health is trying to avoid death or, or providing a counterfeit immortality by a, through a denial of death or something? I don't know. D but it raises the question, is, is a type of medicine counterfeit immortality? Did Jesus' healing give people counterfeit immortality? Did, did the gospel writer Luke, who himself was a physician, when he treated people, when he healed people, did he give them counterfeit immortality? I don't think so, no. So just by the fact that you're receiving a treatment to better your health, to avoid death, is trying to gain immortality? No, that's a leap that, that there's no logic to that. Also, not redeemable. This is downright ridiculous. Are we not redeemable because of a vaccine, because of a shot? And if so, how and why? And where in scripture can you back that claim up? You can't. Because we know from scripture the opposite is the case. Also, the reference to the verse cast alive into the lake of fire, which is 19, Revelation 19.20, this is the wrong verse because this verse is talking about the dragon and the two beasts. Um, if they wanted to quote scripture, they should have quoted 20 verse 15 or 21 verse 8. But even then, those would be incorrect. Uh, as we know from elsewhere in scripture, that it, nowhere does it say those who receive a vaccine will be damned to hell, right? And we know that this is not the mark of the beast because it's a physical and spiritual, or it's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual reality. So this type of thinking, um, turning it into being afraid of something in this world, turning it into a physical mark that we could receive to damn us, it does nothing but twist scripture in order to bind consciences in fear and to bind consciences in work righteousness, right? In this case, what damns you or what saves you? What saves you is not getting the vaccine. So what saves you is a human work, not the life and death and blood of Jesus Christ, but the human work that you avoid doing. 
This is exactly what the Pharisees did in Jesus' own day. They built up human works and avoiding human certain other human works in order to produce righteousness for themselves. But it's not a matter of outward actions, right? It's a matter of the inward heart of faith. And this is what Jesus says to those Pharisees. He quotes Isaiah. They worship me in vain, teaching human rules as if they are doctrines, right? This is very clearly teaching a human rule, a human opinion, a human ideology as a doctrine of scripture. It's putting words in God's mouth, which is one of the highest forms of blasphemy, unfortunately. All right, so next, the UPC code argument. This has been around since UPC codes. The idea is, the theory is that in every UPC code out there, there is the number 666, which is the number of the beast. So this must be the mark of the beast, right? If we see the number 6 here in the code itself, we see two bars. And here's two bars at the beginning, two bars in the middle, two bars at the end of every UPC code. So at first glance, it appears that there is the number 666 on every UPC code because we look at these two bars, these two bars, and these two bars. But uh, really, that's, that's just wrong. It's just not true. It's a myth. First of all, UPC codes go on products. They don't go on people's foreheads and hands. And you might say, they don't go on people's foreheads and hands yet, but it's coming. But that's not the claim that's being made, right? The claim that's being made is UPC codes as they currently have existed are the mark of the beast, which, first of all, they do not go on foreheads and hands as they currently and have previously existed. They go on products, right? So doesn't fit. Also, the idea that all barcodes contain 666, six, six, it's this is completely a myth. It is just not real at all. But it sadly has been quite prevalent pretty much since UPC codes have existed. Um, but these, the three red double bars here at the beginning, middle, and end that people claim are sixes are not really sixes. They just aren't. And in order to understand that, you sort of have to you have to know what the UPC code is saying. You have to be able to read the UPC code as the computer reads it. Um, basically, here is the number six. And in UPC codes, we're not only looking at the two bars. We're also looking at the spaces because that is part of the code that determines what number is what, right? So it's not just the two bars. It's bar, space, bar, space, space, space. So it's also these three spaces at the end, too that go into the number six. The front and the end bars are not just two bars, they are two bars and a space, bar, space, bar. This middle uh, two bars, again, is not just two bars, it's a space, bar, space, bar, space. So when we read it as the computer reads it, as the actual code pro says that it is, it's very clearly not sixes, right? So these, the middle bars are different from the front and end bars, and all of them are different from what the actual number six is. Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, sadly, I had to learn to read barcodes in order to debunk this, but the reason is that people who make this claim don't understand what's going on in a barcode. They don't understand the reality that exists in a barcode. So thinking that these are three sixes is just a result of not knowing how to read barcodes. Um, ultimately, this whole idea of 666 on a barcode is a complete myth. Uh, I don't know if you remember back to 6606, there was a lot of like, you know, joking talk about the end of the world because it was 666, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The point is, there are many other interpretations, there's many other equally non-scriptural theories about this mark of the beast. And they've been around for a very long time. And the reason we forget about some of them is because they were maybe popular for a certain amount of time, but then they proved to be false and everybody completely forgot about them. Here's one example. Here's a book from about 140 years ago called The Mark of the Beast Revealed by the Shape of the Head. So the idea was the shape of your head, the, the um, bumps and the divots on your skull could reveal if you had the mark of the beast on your head. This is a very old practice, pseudoscience. It's called phrenology. 
It was the idea that the shape of the skull determined the shape of the brain, which then determined your personality, your character, etc. But we know that that's not how the brain works. It's not based on the physical shape or size of the brain. It's about the number of synapses, the number of connections in the brain itself. So people thought you could determine personality. You could determine, even do like fortune telling through um, the, the bumps and the divots that you have on your skull. There was a big push to try to find the, what's called the criminal type, that you could tell if someone was gonna be born a criminal or was gonna be part of the criminal element just based on the shape of their skull because that would influence their criminal personality. Here's what's important. This is all complete bunk. It's garbage. It's not science at all. It's been completely disproven. But it shows the danger of interpreting scripture according to popular theories because this was incredibly popular for a long time, this theory called phrenology. It shows us the danger of interpreting scripture through contemporary trends and current events going on. The danger is it's you're going to be wrong because you're not using scripture to interpret scripture. You're using human theories, human trends, current events to go back and interpret scripture. Remember, test all claims about scripture with scripture. Right? So here's a claim being made about scripture, but it's not taken from scripture. It's taken from a human pseudoscientific theory that was a flash in the pan. It was immensely popular, but then it was completely disproven as being uh, bunk. And also study the context, right? The context tells us this is not a physical mark. This is a figurative thing happening. It's symbolic. And the context of the rest of Scripture tells us it is a spiritual mark, not a physical mark. This idea did not age well, right? We don't even talk about this being the mark of the beast today because it's completely wrong. And I have a very sneaking suspicion that these will not age well also. If we look at the big picture, right? This is scripture. Revelation is scripture. It needs to apply to all Christians throughout the end times, not just us, right? Not just us alive here right now today. That's vanity to think that this part of scripture applies to us uniquely out of all Christians. Remember, we have to think of Revelation in terms of the big picture. 200 years from now, Will this interpretation of scripture apply to Christians? I really, really doubt it. And for 2,000 years, this interpretation of scripture didn't apply to any Christian at all. So we have to remember that this being scripture must apply to all Christians throughout the end times. And John, throughout, makes specific reference to that by saying again and again, the 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, it has to be the, the entire end times, not just one generation. Uh, so one, of the, one major point of the two beasts is to warn us of confusing Christ's authority with human authority, right? That's exactly what the second beast does, is it tries to give divine authority to human authority, to get people to worship human systems and authority as if it is divine and as if it is Christ himself because the second beast appears to be the lamb, right? So this means we need to be extremely cautious about confusing personal convictions, institutional convictions, political convictions with what is very clearly in scripture itself, because that's exactly what the beast, the second beast does, is it confuses the inherent meaning of the word of God with our own personal convictions, our own opinions, our own political bias, our own institutional slant, right? So we need to be careful about not falling into this trap, right, of worshiping human systems and human interpretations and human authorities. The important fact about the mark of the beast is unless something requires you to forsake faith in Christ, it has no relation to the mark of the beast. Unless something requires you to forsake the triune God as the only object of your worship, it has no relation to the mark of the beast. What makes the mark of the beast the mark of the beast? Forsaking your faith to worship human systems and authorities. Forsaking Christ, compromising your faith. So unless something, like, unless getting the COVID vaccine requires you to renounce your faith in Christ, it is not and cannot be the mark of the beast, right? 
Um, here's just one example. This is a big hot button topic. Mandatory vaccinations for COVID. That might be a good public policy. It might be a very bad public policy. It might be anywhere in between. But it's exactly that. Public policy. It does not require you to forsake faith. We can argue endlessly about the benefits or, or the, the negatives of mandatory vaccinations, but it's purely a civic public policy thing. It's not a spiritual Christian thing. It would not require you to forsake your faith. It would not require you to worship anything, right? So when we're trying to interpret the mark of the beast, this is the important point. The mark of the beast is something that requires you to forsake or compromise your faith in Christ or requires you to worship something other than the triune God. So uh, uh, one of the concerns that comes up with this, with getting a microchip you know, on my hand or getting the vaccine or something is, is the idea that I, there's something I can receive. There's something I can have happen to my physical body that would compromise my salvation. So can I receive this mark of the beast without me realizing it is the question. Can I do something? Can, if I do get a microchip in my hand, does that mean I'm damned no matter what? Well, another way to ask this question is in this way. Is there something I can do without realizing it that nullifies my salvation? Now, does a question like this sound like the gospel? Does this sound like God's word, which tells me that nothing can separate me from God's love? Nothing that is to come, nothing in heaven on earth, nothing, uh, no powers or authorities can separate me from God's love and nothing can snatch me out of his hand? Or does this sound like the dragon, right? Does it sound like the voice of Satan, who his whole goal is to get me to think my salvation is somehow in jeopardy? That's the only tool he has as the accuser, right? So does this question, can I receive the mark of the beast? Can I be damned without realizing it? Is there something I can do that would completely disqualify me from salvation? That is not the gospel. That is the voice of the accuser who wants you to think that your salvation is in jeopardy, that there's something that could happen to you without realizing it that could damn you to hell. And it's sort of tied into this idea, if what if I sin and I don't realize that I've sinned? Or what if I forget a sin I've committed and so don't repent of it? What if I forget to repent of a sin? Does that sin still damn me? Martin Luther really struggled with this, um, that he would spend, as a monk, he would spend hours and hours and hours in confession because he would try to think up every single sin he had committed because if he left it unconfessed, that sin would still be hanging over him and could still damn him to hell. But thankfully then, um, he had his tower moment and he realized, no, that's not the case at all. Jesus forgives all sins, every single one, even the sins we don't realize we've committed. Even if we forget to repent of a sin, all that sin is still forgiven. God's forgiveness is far greater than our sin. And we have this specific thing being addressed in Psalm 19. Who can discern their own errors? It's a rhetorical question. Nobody can. We can't discern every single time we've sinned in our heart. Uh, who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. When we ask for forgiveness, when we go to God in repentance, we are asking forgiveness for all of our sins, even those hidden ones, the ones we haven't realized. And the, the question to think of is, if you do, if that sin were brought to your attention, if you were made aware of that sin, would you repent of it? If yes, then, you know, there's nothing to worry about. If you would be sorry for that sin, if you were made aware of it, then, the, yeah, it's, it's all of your sin is forgiven in Christ Jesus. All right, so moving on from that. Next, this mark gives one the right to buy or sell. Uh, scripture says that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So this is another point where people will tend to say, well, this is a physical mark, a physical reality, because it gives you the right to buy or sell. Um, however, this, John is referencing something that was called a libellus. Uh, that's a Latin word, and it means literally little book. 
I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. My Latin pronunciation is a little rusty, so go easy on me. Um, but this libellus was a Roman government-issued document. Here's one example of it from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. Uh, one type of libellus was called a certificate of sacrifice because basically it had indicated, it had basically said, yes, you worshipped the emperor as a god or you sacrificed to the emperor, so you're okay. You have the seal of approval. And the, the, this libellus, the certificate of sacrifice, was sealed with a karagma. Remember, that's the, the word, the Greek word that means a mark in the mark of the beast. It's the stamp or the seal of approval. All right, so John is referencing this libellus, this type of libellus that would have the mark, the stamp, the karagma. And um, this, it was first instituted by the Emperor Nero, and this is very important for later on, so keep this in the back of your mind. It was used for hundreds of years in the Roman Empire. It served a variety of purposes, and at times, at certain times and in certain places, it also served as one's license to buy or sell, to be a merchant. It could also sometimes, at times and in places, serve as your authorization to practice a trade, to be a tradesman, right? So at times and in certain places throughout its, its wide and varied use, in order to have government authorization to buy or sell or to practice a trade, you had to have a certificate of sacrifice. You had to have the stamp, the mark, the seal that said, yes, I have acknowledged the emperor as a god, right? This was a big problem for early Christians, um, and this was is what's specifically being addressed as one example here by John, that um, some Christians thought, well, just in order to buy or sell or in order to practice a trade, fine, I'll just sign on the line, I'll say that I acknowledge the emperor as a god, but I don't really do that in my heart, so I'll lie just in order to be able to practice a trade. And the warning here is, you know, don't take this lightly. Don't compromise your faith and your soul worship of the triune God in any kind of light manner, because this is serious business. So what's going on here with this, his reference to being able to buy or sell is John following the pattern that we see elsewhere in Revelation. John is using the libellus, the, the mark or the, the scroll, as one specific example from his own time. And this example is what warns against compromising one's faith to gain any earthly advantage. Compromising your faith and worship in the triune God to say, yes, I worship the emperor as a god in order to buy or sell, to gain an earthly advantage. But the mark of the beast is not just the libellus, right? This does not fulfill the mark of the beast. The true mark of the, it's one example of the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast throughout the end times is big picture, right? It's the compromise of Christian faith in order to gain or sanction human authority, in human institutions, human systems, in order to gain some kind of earthly advantage. So just like John does elsewhere in the book of Revelation and throughout, especially this chapter, he uses one specific example in order to illustrate and help teach what the overall pattern of the mark is. This is just uh, one object lesson of the overall norm of what, what the mark of the beast truly is. So, all those who don't have saving faith, all those who don't have God's seal, God's mark, their name written in the book of life, have the mark of the beast because they've sold out saving faith for some kind of earthly benefit. So that's what John is warning against here in the big picture throughout all of the end times. He's warning against selling out your Christian faith to get some sort of earthly benefit. And everyone who does not have saving faith has done exactly that in some way or for some reason, right? They've thought it more beneficial not to have saving faith or to compromise saving faith for whatever reason, whatever earthly benefit. So, Notice here also that um, it's commonly thought w when people interpret the mark of the beast to be some sort of physical marking, especially like, a, you know, the, the microchip theory, 
people say that some, you know, the earthly government, the one world government or the earthly government is going to force people to get this microchip or corporations will, you know, force people to get the microchip in order to buy or sell their products. But notice the mark and number of the beast do not come from earthly governments or institutions. They don't come from the first beast. They come from the second beast. Notice the mark and number of the beast come from religious authority, particularly Christian seeming authority, right? They, it appears to be the lamb, but in truth, it is the dragon. So that's something very important. Not many interpretations of this keep this fact in mind, that this is not earthly authority doing this, the mark or number of the beast. It is spiritual, religious, Christian seeming, but ultimately unchristian authority that produces the mark and number of the beast, which makes perfect sense, right? Because it's it's misplaced worship. It's, it's worshiping human institutions rather than the one true God. So also keep that in mind. If an interpretation says that it's the mark and number of the beast is, comes from any kind of human authority, earthly government or corporation or institution, it's not accurate according to what scripture says here. All right, which brings us to the number of the beast. Here's what we know from scripture, the plain and simple facts. The number is 666, 666. In some manuscripts, it is 616, 616. We are told to calculate the number. John expects us to be able to figure this out. Um, and he expects people in his own time, his, he expects his immediate audience of the churches in Asia Minor to be able to calculate and figure out who this is. And it is a who because the number is the name of the second beast. It's a human name. It's the number of a man. All right, here's, here's, so here's the facts as we have them from Scripture. Now, there are a number of ways to interpret this. And what follows is one interpretation that explains all of these facts. And it also harmonizes a number of other in common interpretations. Sometimes there's interpretations of this number that seem to be different from each other or contradictory, but they can all be harmonized if you look, once again, at the big picture of things throughout the whole end times. So, um, in order to express numbers in Greek and Hebrew, they didn't have numerals, right? They didn't have one, two, three, four, five, six. They used letters of the alphabet to represent numbers. So A equals one, B equals two, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it, this was called gematria. Uh, this word likely means knowledge of writing, but it was the practice of using letters of the alphabet to represent numbers. Here's the Hebrew alphabet um, and also then the corresponding number that was used for each of the letters. Aleph is one, Beit is two, Gimel three, etc. And then it, by, when it gets to 10, it goes up by tens. So Kaf is 20, Lamed is 30, etc. A common practice involved representing a person's name by the numerical values of the letters in that name. So in order to... Um, express a name, you would take every letter of that name and you would calculate what number it was and then you'd add all of those numbers together. For example, the number of my name, Yaakov, in Hebrew is 182 because you take Yod, which is 10, you take Ayin, which is 70, you take Kof, which is 100, you know, Beit, which is 2, you add it all together. Those are all the letters of the name and you add it to make 182. Now, this was a practice, this gematria was used uh, sometimes to talk about an individual in code, so kind of in secret. One example that's used quite commonly is when you're making fun of a public official. Uh, when you, If you want to make fun of the emperor, for example, um, and, and get away with it, not lose your head, then you could come up with this code for their name. You would calculate the letters of their name into a number, and that number would be would serve as that person for the sake of satire uh, because Roman emperors tended not to have a sense of humor about things like this. So one of the earliest and most commonly accepted names that corresponds to that adds up to 666 is Nero Caesar. Here's uh, Nero, the infamous emperor. We have an example. Here's one example in particular of people calculating Nero's name 
in order to fit a creative insult. One example is Nero equals mother killer because he, he killed his own mother. And so um, the, the specific reference here was a piece of graffiti, anonymous graffiti that said a new calculation, Nero, his own mother's killer. And the letters of the name Nero, uh, which with this name uh, added up to 1005, that also equated to the letters of the phrase his own mother's killer. All of the letters in that phrase in Greek added up to 1005. So it was basically a calculation saying Nero is a mother killer. Nero killed his mother. Um, and the word that was used in this specific example for calculate, when it says calculate this, it's the exact same root word that John uses in Revelation when he says calculate. Um, to calculate, let him calculate the number of the beast. It's the exact same word in Greek. So already we're getting a clue that this, John might be cl cluing us in to say, hey, this is gematria. This number that you're given is the name of a human being. So this, the 666 being Nero Caesar, seems to be the best explanation for all the evidence. Notice that I do qualify this quite heavily. It seems to be the explanation and it, it, because it is a code, it is a symbol. Um, we can't be 100% sure, but it seems to be the best explanation. It's not the only explanation, but it does fit all of the facts from scripture that we are given. Um, and it does explain very, you know, all of the clear evidence we have. And this also easily explains why the number of the beast is 616 in some manuscripts. It's very, very rare to see this, but um, it is a, a variant that we have. And here's why. Because uh, there are a few manuscripts that have 616 instead of 666. And this is easily explained if these numbers do reference Nero. Because 666 is Nero's Greek name, Neron Caesar, Neron Caesar, translated into Hebrew. Here's how we reckon that. Here's the letters and their numbers. It ends up being 666. But 616 is the Latin name. There's a slight difference. There's one letter that's not present there in the Latin name translated into Hebrew, Nero Caesar. And here that is, that makes 616. As you see, this one letter, noon, 50, is not present. And so that drops it down to 616. So scribes who would be copying for a Greek audience would use the original Greek name translated into Hebrew, which is 666. And here the theory is scribes copying for a Latin audience might use the Latin name, the adapted name. Uh, into 616. This is, as I said, extremely rare, though. There's only a few manuscripts we have. However, it could be quite easily explained, quite handily explained, if this number does in fact refer to Nero. So the idea is the number signifies a man, right? It's a man's number. If Nero Caesar is this man, he can't be the fulfillment. He can't be the beast himself because he died 30 years before Revelation was written. He died in the 60s, mid to late 60s AD, and Revelation was written in the mid 90s AD. So he himself is not the fulfillment. He is not the beast. The individual man, Nero, though, could be one example Right? We know elsewhere John uses specific examples from his own time to illustrate the overall pattern. So he could be just John's, the specific example John wants to use in order to say, hey, this is the work of the beast. This is what it's like. Remember Nero, that guy? This is what the beast will do throughout the, the end times. So here is, is sort of the idea of how it works. The number 666 is a symbol for Nero, but Nero himself is being used as a symbol or a specific example of the office of the Roman emperor, right? The Roman emperor who demanded to be treated as a god, who claimed divinity in order to sanction his earthly power. This is what the beast does, the second beast, right? So 
One example of this overall office is Nero, who is then coded into 666 in Gematria. And then this office of the Roman emperor also is not the fulfillment of the beast because it does not cover the whole world and all people through the end times, right? This itself is a symbol for what the beast is, using religious authority like this to sanction human authority, human institutions, human systems. This is, this is what the second beast is throughout the whole end times. One example of that was what the emperors did. One example of the emperor is Nero, and Nero is uh, turned into a code of Gematria for his name being 666. This is sort of like stacking nesting Russian dolls, right? There's a symbol within a symbol within a symbol within a symbol in order to get to the overall meaning, right? So it does follow the pattern, though, that we have in Revelation. John using a specific example to describe the beast as a whole. Ultimately, if this is not correct, if the number 666 is not code for Nero Caesar, it doesn't matter because the number of the beast still has this overall meaning, right? This is the work of the second beast. And the, the specific examples John is giving us all point to this as being the meaning he wants us to arrive at. So why Nero? Why pick the Emperor Nero if he was if he had been rotting in his grave for 30 years by the time John was writing this? It doesn't seem like he would be relevant to what's currently going on. Well, John's audience would remember Nero. They would know Nero, and specifically they would know him as an example of the beast's work. John's audience, the Christians in Asia Minor, also everyone else in the Roman Empire at this time would have had a negative opinion of Nero. So it would have fit John's intention very nicely. He does not want people to think of the beast as being a good thing. And Nero was pretty much universally unpopular during his own reign and afterwards as well. So he was a universally unpopular figure that would have had a negative connotation that, John, that would have been immediately familiar to his audience and all people. Critiquing Nero was very safe. Everyone could do it. Everyone did do it, pretty much. So critiquing Nero was a lot safer than critiquing the office of the Roman emperor or the current emperor, right? So if John wants to warn people of these blasphemies of worshiping the emperor as a god, it would be a lot more dangerous for him to critique, to critique the office as a whole or to critique the current emperor. Everyone could get away with criticizing Nero because he was really unpopular and he was dead. But nobody could get away with criticizing Domitian because he was the current emperor when John was writing Revelation. Um, and so if John had used Domitian as an example, or if he had critiqued the office of the Roman emperor uh, as a whole, that would definitely have brought further persecution upon him, upon the churches, and it very likely would have resulted in this book being uh, being banned, you know, being snagged and burned. Um, and so it would have meant that this, remember, Revelation was written as a letter to these churches to be copied and, and passed around to all of these Christian churches. So openly critiquing Domitian, openly critiquing the Roman emperor as an office would very likely have led to this letter not being able to get into the hands of Christians. Everyone could understand John's hidden meaning because everyone could realize it was Nero, which was then referring to the Roman emperor. But it wouldn't draw the anger of the current emperor because of this series of symbols and codes, right? So there was very little risk of producing further persecution or causing the Roman authorities to seize copies of this letter of revelation. Um, so... The benefits of this interpretation are it fits all of the facts that we have from Scripture. It fits all the criteria, right? It's the, the 666 does equate to Nero Caesar. It's the number of a man. It's a man's name. Um, it fits with everything that we know about the work of the two beasts. It follows the pattern that John has been using of using specific examples from the Roman Empire in order to explain or clarify the overall work of the beasts. And it does explain this textual variant that we really 
don't have a really good explanation for otherwise. There are a few problems with this interpretation, though, as well. Um, one being it takes a lot of calculation. It takes a lot of knowledge in order for us to figure out. And this is something that John clearly thinks some people should be able to figure out, right? He says, he tells his audience, uh, if anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast. However, he does acknowledge it takes insight, and it, he says this calls for wisdom. So maybe he is anticipating that it takes a lot of calculation, and he's giving us fair warning. Um, this, this also um, is an argument against the mark and the number of the beast being something that occurs only within one generation. So if it is a microchip, the number and the mark of the beast um, John is telling his immediate audience, his contemporaries, that they should be able to figure this out. So if it is a microchip, they're not going to be able to figure that out, right? Because they have no idea what that means. So this is also an additional argument that John is expecting his immediate audience. The, the Greek verb here is very clear that the churches in Asia Minor in the 90s AD should be able to figure out what this is. So also that means all Christians throughout the end times should have equal access to being able to figure this out. It's not just us today. It's not special. But the downside of this specific interpretation, 666 being Nero, takes a lot of knowledge and calculation. It does assume that John uses gematria, that he's using the number as uh, a symbol of, of the name calculated into the, the numerals. But the verb calculate is used. John does say calculate, and that was the word that was used to indicate gematria was being used. So we, we can't say for 100% sure, which is why it's a, a problem. And also the leap from 666 to equaling Nero Caesar is not clear from the text itself. In one sense, you sort of have to know that 666 is, means Nero Caesar, before you can know that 666 means Nero Caesar because the text itself doesn't tell you. But that's just one of the downsides of using coded language. All right, so there are a couple uh, other interpretations too. I'll go through these very quickly because I'm, I'm way over my allotment of time. This happened on Sunday morning too. So <laughs> um, some say this could be a reference to King Solomon. He had... Because in First Kings, there's a reference to him getting his annual uh, income was 666 talents of gold. And so some people say that uh, also all the world paid homage and tribute to him. So he also fell away from God. Immediately after describing Solomon's immense wealth in First Kings 10, it then describes right away in verse 1 of chapter 11, it describes how he fell away from God. So the idea is 666 refers to Solomon gaining the world but losing his soul, compromising his faith, forsaking his faith for worldly gain, which is exactly what the work and mark of the beast is. However, 666 is not the number of the man himself, Solomon. It's not the number of his name. His name is equals in Gematria is 375. King Solomon is 465. So I tried this a number of different ways to try to make 666 fit into some expression of King Solomon's name. Couldn't do it. So it's the number of the gold, not the number of the man. Also, the number 666 is a reference to only one aspect of King Solomon's wealth, where there's a, a, a lot of other numbers used to reference other aspects of his wealth in 1 Kings 10. So why, you know, how, why would he be talking about 666 specifically when there's all of these other numbers and elements of that wealth? Also, Solomon's wealth is not the reason that he fell from God. 1 Kings 11 says very clearly um, that he married hundreds of wives and they who, who worshipped foreign gods, other gods, false gods, and the influence of his hundreds of wives and their worship of false gods is what made him fall away from the one true God. So those things make it not quite fit King Solomon. Also, it doesn't explain the textual variant of 616. 
like Nero Caesar does. Another interpretation is 666 is the unholy trinity. So, uh, and that has been described in a few ways. Sin, death, the devil, world, flesh, the devil, devil, antichrist, false prophet. That's the dragon and the two beasts. Um, seven, remember, is the divine number. And so 777 would be the divine trinity. 666 strives to be divine, strives to be seven, but it falls short, right? And so this does describe the general spirit of the number of the beast, claiming to be divine, seeming divine, but falling short. However, it doesn't explain why John tells us it's the number of a man and we should be able to calculate it, right? Because this does not refer to a specific person or or specific aspect of humanity. So in summary, you don't have to agree with this Nero interpretation in order to know exactly what's being said here. That's the upside of this. The, the number of the beast is, um, the 666 is just one clue that John is giving us to help us understand the mark of the beast, which we can understand very clearly based on everything else we are given in this text. And he also says the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So the number of the beast equals the name of the beast, which equals the mark of the beast. It's all the same thing. What he's doing is he's giving us specific examples here in order to help us understand the overall work of the beast. But it, it all is the same thing. The mark of the beast is a result of not having saving faith, not having the mark of faith, the seal of God, right? And so the mark of the beast, the number of the beast is compromise of faith or um, rejection of faith for some sort of earthly advantage. Uh, next is 666 satanic. 666 is also often used as a satanic number, um, but it's not directly satanic uh, because it's the number of a man. It's the number of a human being, not the number of the dragon or the devil. It is... Um, Indirectly satanic because the beast does the work of Satan, speaks with the voice of the dragon, but any reference to 666 meaning the devil or the dragon um, is not scriptural because it's, it's not the number of the devil or the dragon. It is the number of a man, not the number of the devil. Uh, anthropos is the Greek word that's used there. And also, just in general, keep in mind that the number 666 is a number, so it will just naturally occur in context or you know various contexts just because something has 666 doesn't mean it's insidious or evil you know i've worked as a cashier before and i've i've given change the the when people give me cash very rarely the change will come up as being six dollars and 66 cents i don't think that means anything other than it's just a number like any other number that you would have to calculate for a change so you know you you'll see this all over the place. It is a number. It will just occur. So just because something has 666 doesn't mean it's insidious or evil or the work of the beast. And the summary here, with the mark of the beast, John uses a specific example from his own time, the libellus, to explain the overall pattern during the whole end times of the Christian church. That is idolatry, worship of human authority, or compromising faith for earthly advantage. The same way, the number of the beast, John uses a specific example from his own time, that is Nero, or more broad, broadly, the office of the emperor, to explain the overall pattern during the end times, using religious authority, Christian seeming authority, to endorse human authority, to put faith in human authority. So this fits exactly what John does with the whole book of Revelation. He writes to Christians not only in his own times, he uses specific examples for those Christians in his own times, but he's also writing for the big picture throughout the whole end times. And some concluding thoughts here. If you remember back a couple chapters to Revelation 10, what introduced this um, was this angel appeared to John and this angel had was given all of these symbols of God's presence, his glory, guidance, and protection. He had the rainbow, the face shining like the sun, dressed in a cloud, right? All of those were symbols of God's presence, glory, guidance, and protection. Remember also, he had his feet firmly planted on both the sea 
and on the land. And where do these beasts come from? The first one comes from the sea. The second one comes from the land. But this angel of God and God himself already has his feet firmly planted on both of those things. God's foot has already trampled over the two beasts, both the, the, the sea and the land, because God's foot has already crushed the head of their master, the dragon, right? He did that through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, which crushed that ancient serpent's head once and for all. So Christ Jesus, elsewhere in scripture, we know he already has all things under his feet. So here, the devil, sin, death, everything crushed under Jesus' feet. So if there's any interpretation of this difficult portion of scripture that leads to points people towards fear to get people afraid of some human thing, some human authority, something in this life and in this world, that doesn't fit what we hear of elsewhere in scripture. And basically introducing this section of the dragon and the beasts is God's presence, glory, guidance, and protection already has is already established it's already firmly planted on the sea and the land over all things right so that's what when we read revelation and read these difficult portions of scripture that's what we have to keep in mind and remember christ jesus is already victorious there's absolutely no reason to fear anything in this world or in this life because christ as he says i have overcome the world so that is the end. That is where we will leave it for this time. Thank you very much for joining me and for taking quite a bit longer of time with me than <laughs> uh, we normally do for a Bible study. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this, please don't hesitate to reach out to me through the email, through my cell phone number, calling the church. Um, I'm very happy to uh, to answer any questions you may have, just so nothing is unclear in your mind about what this is saying. Uh, as you can tell, I'm more than happy to go into uh, exhausting detail <laughs> about any of this. So with that, I will leave this here. Thank you very much for joining me. May God bless you richly until we meet again.